Welcome to Grand Rounds at the UCSF Osher Center for Integrative Health. My name is Shelley Adler, and I'm the director of the Osher Center. And today it is my great pleasure to introduce my uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Ellen Langevin. Uh, Dr. Langevin is director of the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, NCCIH. Uh, as director, she oversees the federal government's lead agency for research on the fundamental science, usefulness, and safety of complementary and integrative health approaches and their roles in uh, improving uh, health and healthcare. Um, although I'm sure everyone knows, I'll just note that NCCIH funds and conducts research to help answer important scientific and public health questions within the context of whole person health. And the center also coordinates and collaborates with other research institutes and federal programs on research into complementary and integrative health. Dr. Langevin is uh, currently the chair of the Interagency Pain Research Coordinating Committee. Um, uh, now, it gives me great joy to say that before joining NIH, <laughs> Dr. Langevin was director of the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston. They are of the 11 centers, um, the center that came right after the uh, UCSF Osher Center. And she served as director of the Osher Center and uh, professor of medicine at Harvard uh, Medical School from 2012 to 2018. She's also um, served as professor uh, of neurological sciences. Uh, this is at the University of Vermont, which I'm particularly happy to say is now one of the newest Osher centers. Um, the uh, Vermont Osher Center was established in 2022. So uh, over her really remarkable career, Dr. Langevin's research interests have centered on the role of connective tissue in chronic musculoskeletal skeletal pain and the mechanisms of acupuncture, manual, and movement-based therapies. Her most recent work uh, focuses on the effects of stretching on uh, inflammation resolution mechanisms with connect connective tissue. Uh, after this presentation, a bit of housekeeping, we'll have about 15 minutes for discussion. Please submit your questions to me directly by way of the chat uh, anytime during the presentation. So you can just do that and then focus on the presentation. And when we have our Q&A in the last 10 minutes, you're also welcome and actually encouraged to go on video um, and ask your question directly, or I can do that uh, for you. Um, finally, I want to thank our terrific Grand Rounds Planning Committee, Drs. Selena Chan, Anand Druva, and Patty Moran, uh, as well as the absolutely wonderful Jen Shea, Yvette Coulter, and Julia Burns. So please now join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Langevin. Well, thank you so much, uh, Shelley. This is such a pleasure to, for me to be here. And um, as, uh, as, as mentioned, I consider myself still an honorary member of the Osher family. Um, <laughs> whether you want me or not, I'm there. <laughs> So I just I just love to watch how the uh, Osher collaborative and, and and all of the centers have con have been flourishing and it's just a delight for me uh, to be giving these grand rounds uh, great great pleasure. Thanks. So um, I am going to be sharing my screen for a minute. Can you all see this? Yes. So, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is the is 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 really a, what we call mapping a pathway to whole person health, which is really the theme of our new our new strategic plan, which is not quite so new now because I mean it was uh, released in 2021, but implement. I'm going to talk a little bit about how this strategic plan came about, but also and most importantly how we are implementing uh, this strategic plan. And uh, that's the, really the fun part, right? So, um, oops, there we go. Mapping a pathway to whole person health. And, and, and um, I, I really like this picture of this uh, path uh, through the woods um, that has, you know, you know, little, you know, places along it where you have to watch out that you don't trip. Um, there, you know, whole person health is, 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 is very ambitious, 
uh, you know, goal, which I will tell you about, but it, it's something that we are very excited about uh, to embrace, but it's also something that um, we are conscious is, is uh, uh, challenging. So um, I'm going to explain a little bit why whole person health, why we think this was an important uh, direction for NCCIH to, to pursue, and uh, how, how we're planning on navigating uh, the, the challenges of, 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 the, of these goals. So uh, the first thing is, um, when you think about NCCIH, right, before this whole person health sort of plan, um, there was an emphasis on what we call complementary and still call complementary and integrative therapies, but sort of in a in a in one at a time kind of thing, you know. Um, and and here uh, talking about the the middle C of NCCIH, complementary. You know, what does that mean? So you know, complementary therapies, for example, like acupuncture or uh, massage therapy or yoga or natural products. I mean, these were all things that were uh, where, where NCCIH uh, funded research on these various different kinds of modalities. But what we started to think about is where do these modalities fit in, in the larger landscape of the kinds of therapies that are available uh, to, to patients? And so we, at the beginning of, of, of um, drawing our strategic plan, we, we made this map, we call this our bubble diagram, where we, and this is by not, by no means uh, uh, an attempt to represent all of the different kinds of complementary therapies that exist, that, that's not it, uh, or, 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 or those that are more important or less important. It's, a, it's just examples of where the, the kinds of therapies that NCCIH uh, funds and that are practiced you know, in, in the real world, are where are they in relationship to three big sort of categories that we call nutritional, psychological, and physical. And the overlap between these categories and also the overlap of these categories with other kinds of categories, such as drugs, for example, or devices. So if we look at these categories kind of uh, one at a time, you can see, for example, in the big sort of nutritional bubble, there are a lot of different things that are in there uh, that include, for example, food, you know, and the things that we eat, but also um, supplements, things that people eat to supplement their diet or take out either orally, you know, to, to supplement their diet, vitamins and minerals, for example, but also, or, 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 or probiotics or prebiotics, but also other kinds of products that may uh, be outside of this nutritional category, or for example, things that people would not necessarily consume as part of their diet. And for like medicinal plants, for example, uh, or uh, plants that would be used, for example, in traditional Chinese medicine, for example, with a specific intent uh, that is, that is uh, more therapeutic as opposed to uh, part of somebody's diet, like somebody would eat, you know, ginger or garlic, for example, as part of the food that they eat. So there's a slight distinction as, uh, and, and we felt that mapping out this landscape was useful for us to really understand, you know, where all these various, uh, you know, uh, components lie. The other place that is interesting is the, the category of dietary supplements and botanical drugs, because the same compound uh, can be considered a supplement versus a drug, depending on simply the dose that you use, you know, in, an increase of dose of a compound can be, may be used for a therapeutic purpose and therefore be labeled as a drug. So there's, there's an interesting overlay here uh, between these different categories. And the other interesting overlay is between the nutritional and the psychological category in the form of mindful eating. And we think this is important because nutrition is not just the food that you eat, but it's also the, the, your diet and your dietary patterns and when you eat and, 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 and uh, you know, the various social uh, interactions around eating. So moving on to the psychological category, you can see that um, the, the, the interesting thing here is that there are uh, a, a, low, a lot of overlap between the psychological and the physical category. If you think about something like meditation, for example, um, 
there is a, a physical component to meditation. It's not entirely psychological. A lot of times people will focus on breathing, various different you know, aspects of their body sensations. But um, there are other, um, for example, uh, more uh, psychological with less, even though nothing is purely one or the other, but the, for example, cognitive behavior therapy uh, would be more categorized in the psychological uh, component as well as certain spiritual practices. But uh, it's also important to note that the boundary between what's complementary and what's conventional is also blurred in those areas. For example, uh, co uh, cognitive behavior therapy increasingly um, in, uh, in incorporates elements of relaxation techniques or mindfulness. So, you know, it, it's really nice to think that these therapies are starting to bleed into one another, which is a really good thing. You know, they're really getting integrated. Moving over to the physical, all the way to the right side, um, manual therapies where uh, somebody is really using their hands to 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 apply, for example, uh, pressure or or you know, different types of mechanical forces to the body that would be more considered physical. But then uh, things like yoga or tai chi, well, they clearly have a strong you know physical component, but a psychological component about it as well. And then there's acupuncture, which is interesting because it kind of is in a category by itself because it has a psychological and a physical component for sure. But it's also uh, utilizes a device needles to deliver a stimulus. So um, you can see that th this landscape is quite rich. But importantly, in this particular slide, I show these, these categories are all listed sort of separately. But in practice, very often, they get used in combination. And here I kind of outlined a, uh, a, a linking uh, these various different types of using medicinal plants, you know, herbs, diet, um, for example, yoga and, or manual therapy in something like Ayurveda, right? Which is an ancient practice um, that that combines a lot of these. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's not just one thing used in isolation. And this is, I, we think that this is important, that it has not been emphasized enough. And I know, you know, at UCSF, there's been some uh, leading uh, research in this area of studying you know, Ayurveda as a what we call a whole health system. And so, um, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to refer to these kinds of whole systems. And we came up with this uh, kind of definition for us operationally, thinking about complementary therapies as either, you know, a combination or single or combination of dietary, physical, and or psychological approaches that may have originated outside of conventional medicine, but are gradually being incorporated into uh, mainstream healthcare to varying degrees. And then thinking about multimodal therapeutic systems that are would be composed of multimodal or multi-component approaches that address multiple aspects of a person. And importantly, it's not just that these, these therapies are put together in a package. There's a theory, there's a, there's a framework that underlie how these therapies are used in combination. And this is, we think is very important, that these, uh, these therapeutic systems may utilize diagnostic and therapeutic frameworks that are different from those of conventional medicine. And I'm gonna talk about this for a little bit because I think this is really, really important. So if you look at this little uh, you know, uh, picture, imagine that this represents a person, right? And that all of the different little symbols here def define the, the different signs and symptoms that the person might pre present with. And if you would look at this, and you might look at this and say that there's a lot of red here. And so you might say, oh, this person has, you know, a red disease. But if you, if you just turn off the color and instead you focus on the shapes uh, of, of these various, you know, little symbols, and that each symptom now corresponds to a shape, and especially if you highlight them like this, you see that a person has more squares than circles, and you might conclude that this person has a square disease instead of a, of a red disease. So um, we think that this is this is illustrates how viewing the same individual, but viewing from two different you know frameworks or or, or through different lenses can illuminate different aspects of of an individual. And we think that studying how uh, something like Ayurveda or traditional Chinese medicine may look at the same patient, but in a very different way. We think that we have a lot that we can learn from this. 
um, that this, this is an area that's very rich for further exploration. And we have put this into our strategic plan to develop uh, methods to either uh, operationalize or study the inter-rater reliability of these various different uh, traditional um, uh, frameworks to see whether they can be, first of all, done in a replicable way and that could be lead to uh, rigorous research. We think this is very, very important. So just to recapitulate, uh, going back to our letter C here, uh, so we think about this as, as complementary therapies, practices, and systems, in, in interest, importantly, that use nutritional, physical, and or psychological approaches that may have originated outside of conventional medicine. So this is kind of our framework for thinking about complementary therapies. Now, if we move on to the letter I for integration, it gets really interesting here. Because typically, right, when we think about integrative health or integrative medicine, we think about them as bringing complementary therapies with together with conventional medicine. And that's how we think of the integration. But when we started thinking about what, to, what integration means, uh, we, we think it, it, it really should, it can and should go a step further. And what do we mean by that? A lot of conventional medicine is really limited by what we call, you know, the typical silos, right? So, you know, you, you, you go to your heart, heart doctor for your heart, you know, and your foot doctor for your foot. And, you know, you, your people, and this is a complaint that a lot of patients have about conventional care is that it, it's very fragmented. It's not integrated. And so um, we, we think that this is something that we need to pay a lot more attention to. And the reason for that is that in medicine, way back from the origins of medicine, back in the, in the late 19th century, where all these various different organ systems, cardiovascular, digestive, respiratory, et cetera, this is how medicine has been organized. And this is how medical subspecialties is organized and uh, medical departments, academic departments. And so, and we've become really used to thinking about the human body in a compartmentalized way. And then these, at least these organs is divided in, 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 into different kinds of tissues and then different kinds of cells and signaling pathways, et cetera, and molecules. And we've gotten more and more and more going in the analytic direction uh, throughout the 20th century. Uh, you know, medicine has really become very, very, very analytic. And the consequence of this is that the predominant form of treatments that we are offering conventional medicine is uh, molecular, you know, essentially biochemical, which is drugs, right, pharmacology. But um, fortunately, um, the countercurrent to this analysis is synthesis, right, putting things back together. And we have already uh, started, um, you know, the, the, the whole field of systems biology, for example, uh, integrative physiology is a field that, that has been existed for quite some time, but is really gathering steam. Network biology is another one where we're starting to understand that we really need to put the put you back, picture back together, not just at the level of the individual, but even going further to understand the individual social and environmental context and where they live. And this whole conversation that we're having about social determinants of health, so important and to understand that the, the, all of those uh, environmental, social and physical impacts on the health of the person. So we think that this whole countercurrence of analysis and synthesis need to be done together. Right. It's not just, you know, not just one or the other, both. So um, here, um, summarizing uh, for the letter I for integrative at NCCIH, we really pay a lot of attention to advancing research, both on the integration of complementary and conventional care and integrative approaches to physiology, understanding the normal functioning in the body in an integrative way, not just one system at a time, pathophysiology, understanding how uh, the various different interactions between the different organs and systems of the body and the environment, the social and environment and physical environment influences uh, health and disease and also treatment. Now, let's move on to the letter H. So H for health. Well, um, one of the ways that I often start this conversation about our letter H is to look at these plants. So the plants on the left looks pretty healthy. And the plants on the right look at looks like it's got some sort of disease. But the plant in the middle looks like it's not quite healthy, but it's it's it looks like if it got better care, it could actually revert uh, back to health. So um it's the same thing with people. Um, you know, in, in 
people don't jump to disease uh, in all of a sudden. There's there's often a, a gradual path from healthy to less healthy to finally the development of frank you know disease or illness. And the way we uh, our our system of medicine really uh, focuses more on disease than it focuses on health. And as I mentioned earlier, we tend to think of these diseases as separate and we treat the diseases of like cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, et cetera, using different uh, of often drugs that can sometimes you know, interfere with one another. However, uh, what we don't often uh, pay enough attention to is the fact that there are uh, antecedents to these diseases, uh, poor sleep, poor diet, sedentary lifestyle, and especially chronic stress. And the same factors are, are predisposing factors to many uh, of types of diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, depression, uh, degenerative joint disease, et cetera. So we have uh, this, what we sometimes call these co-occurring conditions that are not simply co-occurring. They really have common uh, 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 root uh, uh, you know, factors that lead to them. Of course, there are other factors such as genetics, et cetera. But we think that the behavioral um, factors that lead to many, many different types of diseases that uh, really are stemming from uh, lifestyle are extremely important. And fortunately, if especially if addressed early, many of these uh, are, are reversible, such that uh, by using a combination of self-care, uh, multi-component interventions, including psychological, nutritional, and physical uh, interventions, uh, can help to uh, to reverse uh, a, an early development of uh, pathology and restore health. This is what we call health restoration. It's not just disease prevention. It goes a step further than that. It really actively, this approach actively uh, is, is uh, aims to help people restore uh, their health. Now, in order to understand how this might be possible, uh, it's really also important that we, we, we think of, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the body, uh, the, the individuals and beyond their environment as a set of complex multi-scale networks that what goes on at every level of the individual can impact all the other levels. And we're starting to understand this. This is really taking uh, what we uh, applying what we have learned from other fields, like ecology, for example, that in order to understand each of each part is important to understand the whole, and the whole is important to understand each part. And so the the field of network science and systems biology is really helping us to address to understand how we can study uh, a complex uh, multi scale network uh, such as this and apply this to the study of human health. So just to give you an example of this, imagine that you could uh, focus on somebody's metabolism, for example. Imagine that you could represent the entire metabolic network of somebody. And if imagine somebody is moving from a healthier state to a less healthy state, and the less healthy state here would be represented in red. And that would be called pathogenesis, right? That would be, imagine that, that somebody is in the middle of developing a disease like early diabetes, for example. Now, what would happen if the, the reverse happened? Is the person moved from the less healthy state back to the healthier state? So maybe they decided they want to start exercising or they, they want to improve their diet or um, they started using uh, a meditation app or something to help them sleep, which gives them more energy to exercise and to prepare uh, healthy meals for themselves. What would happen here? Uh, is this just pathogenesis in reverse? Would you actually undo uh, all the sort of metabolic and physiological you know, consequences or perhaps having uh, been sedentary for a couple of years and not having eaten right? We don't know, right? Um, are there uh, activation of specific pathways that actually promote uh, salutogenesis? Um, are there specific uh, you know, things that happen that are, that are, uh, promote the creation of health, uh, metabolically, for example, or physiologically. And this is where this wonderful analogy to this, uh, bowl, um, is called kintsuchi. And this is actually an art in Japan 
where you take a broken bowl and you repair it using something like gold, for example. And in this art, the bowl is uh, more beautiful uh, than it was when it started, uh, before it broke. And the idea is that uh, the process of salutogenesis can actually be uh, a process of growth uh, for an individual. Uh, growth from many different points of view, psychological growth, from having overcome a challenge, but also maybe even physiological growth. We know, for example, that after having been uh, ill, if you have an infection, for example, your immune system remembers. And so you, uh, your immune system essentially strengthens as a result of having been sick. So this is something that uh, is very important, and I think, to understand better. So this is why we're very excited to have NCCIH is one of us, um, uh, several institutes and centers at NIH that is uh, leading uh, this, pro uh, this uh, very exciting uh, com uh, pro common fund program. This is a program that's NIH-wide uh, and on what we call bridge to artificial AI or bridge to artificial intelligence. And uh, the, uh, the goal of this program is to uh, create these very large and uh, comprehensively annotated data sets that are uh, meant to address what we call grand challenges, problems that we could not address uh, any other way. Uh, and uh, we're very happy that, uh, and, and, these, and these data sets will include many, many different kinds of data, including you know, metabolomics and transcriptomics at the molecular level, all the way to health records, environmental behavior, social, I mean, it really integrates the whole gamut. You can see how this is such a nice fit for studying the kind of multi-scale network that I was talking about earlier. And so we're very, very pleased that one of the projects um, that was funded as part of the Bridge to AI is about salutogenesis in patients with early uh, diabetes. So uh, we're going to be very excited to uh, follow this, this uh, how this project uh, progresses. So just in, in summary, uh, going back to our letter H, um, addressing, H stands for health, addressing health promotion, restoration, resilience, disease prevention, and symptom management. And of course, symptom management is important and key and needs to continue to be part of our overall uh, focus on, 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 on health. So um, just in summary then, um, you can see that our strategic plan uh, we defined whole person health as empowering, empowering individuals, families, communities, and populations to improve their health in multiple interconnected domains, biological, behavioral, social, and environmental. So you can see that it's quite broad. Now, you, know, you could say, wow, that's pretty ambitious, and it is. And so you know, how do you kind of you know, as I said uh, at the beginning, how do you implement a program like that? Clearly, you know, you have to go in steps, right? So one of the uh, first, uh, one of the things that we thought right from the beginning that we had to do is we had to um, kind of gather our uh, some stakeholders to really um, galvanize the community to, first of all, understand what these goals are and uh, get together to support uh, the importance of whole person health as something that can bring the entire complementary and integrative health community together. Because in the past, um, there really hadn't been, I mean, you know, there were there were groups of people who are interested, for example, in acupuncture or in chiropractic care or, you know, in, in natural products, but there, really people had not coalesced together to, to, perf to, to under a common goal. And so we were curious to see whether the, the scientific and research and, 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 and patient care, uh, patient uh, uh, advocacy, for example, would be interested in, in coalescing around uh, a theme like this. So in October of, of the last year, we held a, a meeting uh, for a stakeholder meeting for research on whole person health. And we were delighted uh, that uh, we had a wonderful participation. Uh, people were invited if they were representing organizations uh, with an interest in whole person health. And we had 100 plus organizations represented, including researchers, clinicians, students, policymakers, administrators, business people. And uh, this is just an example. This is uh, of, of the kinds of organizations that were present here. Uh, you can see on the left, 
uh, all, all the, the, the more the, compl the, 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 the classic sort of complementary type of organizations like uh, Society for Acupuncture Research, for example, like the American Osteopathic Association, you have the American uh, Massage Therapy Association, but also the American Physical Therapy Association. You see that kind of blend between the conventional and the the uh, con and and um, complementary music therapy, for example, Ayurveda. I mean, the list goes on. You can see on the left. Now, on the right were organizations that were more umbrella type of organizations, or organizations that already had like an integrative medicine or an integrative health uh, focus. You know, including the Academic Consortium for Integrative Medicine and Health, including the VA, including, uh, you know, Nova Institute, for example. And then you had some uh, organizations that are uh, uh, more kind of uh, interested in specific, you know, diseases, for example, International Foundation for Gastrointestinal uh, Disorders, um, the Elders danlo Society, Fibromyalgia. So you can see there was a very, very uh, large kind of uh, group. And uh, at this, uh, uh, there's going to be, you know, uh, follow up, you know, for, from this meeting. Uh, but the 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 important conclusions of this meeting is yes, it was near unanimous, uh, uh, you know, agreement that whole person health is something that all of these organizations feel that they that they want to get behind. So um, the other thing that we want to uh, we wanted to do is very important is to think about how do you do research on whole person health? This is not something uh, for the faint hearted. Uh, it's a lot harder to do research on the whole person than it is to do research on a, a single uh, molecule, for example, a drug uh, that would inter in interact with a, a molecular target, for example. So uh, we held a workshop, a wonderful workshop in September of 2021 uh, on, uh, that was divided into four parts. First part in the upper left is how do you study interconnected systems? It's kind of what I was talking about before. We know a lot, as, for example, on relationship between the, the brain and, say, uh, the heart, right? We've known this for a long time because there's nervous system controls the cardiovascular system through the autonomic nervous system. But what about the brain and the gut? It's only recently, relatively recently, that we've become aware of what we now call the gut brain axis. Before understanding, how important the microbiome is, we didn't really know a whole lot about that, about how the gut influences the brain. We know the brain can influence the gut, but what about the other way around? And we understand this now, uh, that this is a very important area. But what if you added another system? Say you added the musculoskeletal system. What about how you move? Does that influence, this, influence the amount of exercise you get? Does that influence the relationship between your gut and your brain? It gets more complicated, right? The more systems you add. So how do you do this kind of research? Um, now, the upper right corner is how do you study the impact of, say, a single intervention on multiple systems. Say you wanted to look at the effect of meditation or yoga on the combination of brain, gut, and musculoskeletal system. How would you do this kind of research? It's not easy, right? Uh, on the lower uh, left, how to investigate the impact of multi-component interventions. Say you wanted to do a combination of diet, exercise, and say mindfulness on a single system like the brain. Um, that's complicated because you have to now um, kind of figure out how you're going to uh, do this research. Are you more interested in, compare, in, in looking at the impact of which of these interventions is, is actually making a difference? Or is it the package of the interventions together that makes a difference? And these are all interesting research questions. And how do you design a study to look at that? And then finally, on the lower right, putting the whole thing together, the impact of multiple interventions on multiple systems. And this is where it gets really hard. There is very, very little existing research on this. Um, and so this is at this workshop, and I really encourage those of you that are interested in uh, to visit our website. There's um, there's a, a, a video. It was video cast, and uh, just go to nccih.gov, and um, you can see um, the, um, the the video of all of these sessions. It's really really interesting, um, and uh, there's. It really shows how, first of all, how far we've come 
in already developing the kinds of methods that can be applied to this, in term, in, including the kinds of things I was mentioning before, uh, understanding how to use electronic health records, understanding how to use these sort of multi-omic approaches that look across multiple systems, under, understanding how to use artificial intelligence, under, understanding how to use different kinds of research designs, like N of one designs, for example, to look at complicated you know, uh, interventions. So um, very, very interesting workshop. Uh, I also want to talk about really quickly about another aspect of whole person research uh, whole person health, that is, how do you actually measure whole person health? Um, it, we think this is very important to identify a set of determinants for whole person health that will capture the whole person in all the aspects, right? The biological, the behavioral, the social, the environmental, all in one. But that which using a data set, for example, that wouldn't be so huge and enormous that it becomes unusable. So we issued a request for information uh, to solicit public comments on defining a key set of determinants that address the, all the elements of the whole person. And we're in the middle of uh, identifying this. It's very important, this uh, interesting. This is, this is the, uh, a word cloud of the responses that we got. We had a very nice response from the, the RFI. And these are the types of factors that you would suspect, you know, sleep, exercise, uh, uh, health services, accessibility, spirituality, all kinds of all kinds of of, of, of factors that um, that you all felt was important that we think are important too. So we're in the middle of sort of putting this together. It's going to be very interesting. And finally, I just want to point out, and this is not a new uh, graph, but it it's it shows how at NCCIH we have funding types of funding opportunities that can address all of this the various different aspects going all the way from basic and mechanistic to translational to different kinds of clinical studies looking at in, uh, refinement and optimization of an intervention, including what I was just talking about, you know, uh, developing methods for, for example, uh, defining like a whole health uh, intervention and, or diagnostic system, looking at efficacy, effectiveness, and finally, at the far right, the dissemination and implementation science and how important that is. Whoops, my slides switched on its own. But um, uh, anyway, um, the we think that it's very important to look at implementation uh, as a, an area that we we really want to 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 study very very carefully. Um, for example, we know that there are interventions we know are effective. For example, for pain uh, that uh, are just not being utilized. They're not being implemented in, in healthcare. It takes a long time for research uh, to results to actually change how healthcare is practiced. And the, the, the topic of implementation science is really what studies, what are the barriers to either the dissemination? Is it people that don't know about it or they know about the science, but they're just not changing the, the, their healthcare practices. So um, I, I hope I, this gives you a snapshot of um, the kind of research that NCCIH is interested in and is funding as part of our new strategic, strategic plan and how building a pathway uh, to whole person uh, health is something that we find very exciting and I hope that you do too. And look forward to hear your uh, questions. Thank you so much, Helen. <laughs> Just fantastic. Very, very exciting and um... I think shows such promise uh, for the future of the field of integrative health and, and research in particular. Um, it's wonderful to see core principles of integrative medicine ap applied to research, the kind of the, kind of the holism, the understanding uh, of, of multimodal techniques. Um, I, I, I find it absolutely wonderful. Um, we have uh, several questions. I'm going to invite people first uh, who want to go on video. I see our uh, wonderful um, uh, uh, East Asian medicine, uh, Chinese medicine practitioner, Helen Yi has joined us. Um, and why don't we start with you and then we'll move to Dr. Ashley Mason. Thanks, I had a hard time <laughs> unmuting myself. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for your talk. My question is, how do you address health and social disparities 
due to structural racism with whole health um, systems and whole person health research? And how well can these outcomes be implemented through adv advocacy and other methods? Well, uh, really in addressing health uh, disparities as front and center, not just at NCCIH, but at all of NIH, uh, we have really so much ramped up our efforts to make sure that every, all the research um, that we fund is, it, is, is seen through a lens of equity, right? To make sure that the, um, for example, uh, participants for a given study uh, are recruited in a way that um, includes, you know, a, a representation of the appropriate sample that also includes, you know, patients from, you know, minorities and, you know, racial and ethnic minorities, but also social economic uh, representation uh, that that is that is, um, you know, appropriate to the study design, but also, but that but that that is. Um, that this is speci specifically something that we want to try to understand better. What is it that is uh, makes people of certain, uh, you know, uh, underserved populations, for example, more vulnerable to a specific conditions, and at the same time, le have least access to a specific kind of therapy that could be helping them. So it's like a double whammy, right? There's this increased vulnerability and there's the, there's the reduction in uh, access to the therapies. And so we, we pay a lot of attention to that. For example, we've got, you were uh, as part of the HEAL initiative. Um, there's been uh, funded studies, for example, looking at uh, pain management in uh, federally, federally qualified uh, healthcare uh, systems in uh, American Indian, Alaska Native populations, uh, and it, specifically looking at these populations, rural populations, we are extremely underserved in terms of uh, especially, you know, pain management, but not just pain management, many other aspects of healthcare. So this is something that we have specific funding opportunities for that. We also issue supplements to, uh, uh, to awards in order to increase recruitment, for example, of, of underserved populations when people have challenges, you know, in this area to help, you know, with that. So we address this in multiple different ways. We also want to make sure that investigators uh, from underserved, you know, or minority, minority serving institutions have uh, a um, access to uh, all the resources that they need in order to be able to write competitive grants. And we've, we've just recently released uh, a um, a request of uh, a uh, funding opportunity that is it's closed now, but for virtual resource centers to uh, help uh, organizations uh, to to um, to do research on complementary to to support the infrastructure uh, to do uh, research on complementary and integrative health, and we think that this is going to be very helpful for uh, schools, for example, that don't have the resources uh, to submit. Uh, you know, competitive uh, grant applications. So we're very excited about those things, all those efforts. Thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, Helen has been very active at our center in this area and what we are now calling integrative health equity. Um, and so it's, it's very good to hear about these things. Um, I always note the irony of the fact that overwhelmingly the um, uh, healing uh, practices we're talking about come from around the world from a variety of different places. And yet in the United States, they manifest in a way that make them often inaccessible for people who are actually the inheritors of these, uh, you know, really re remarkable systems. Um, Helen, uh, are we, are, I don't know if you wanted to follow up or are we moving to another? And I also want to point out that we really, UCSF has been such a leader in this area for such a long time. And so, you know, I want to congratulate all of you at UCSF for, for well, your leadership in this area. We've got a wonderful group of folks here, including uh, um, people working, I work with Maria Chow and others on the, um, uh, our Integrative Health Equity and Applied Research uh, Summer Institute for, for uh, undergraduates to learn research methods, people who are focused on uh, health equity. Um, so I let me switch now to Dr. Ashley Mason, and then I'll get some of the, um, uh, chat comments before coming back to video. Hello, thank you for this wonderful presentation. 
Um, my, my question is a lot more specific. I'm going to zoom in. I saw something <laughs> on your slides. Uh, so I study whole body hyperthermia and the treatment of depression in an NCCIH funded uh, mechanism right now. And I was really excited to see on your slide there where it said heat cold therapies. And I was wondering if you might be able to um, speak to any about anything about NCCIH's interest in this. It's a very emerging area. Um, I'm not aware of other institutes being interested in it at all. So I uh, would love to hear anything you, you might share about that. Well, you know, you're more of an expert on this than, than, than I am for sure. Uh, I, I think, you know, we, we listed the heat cold therapies um, mainly because they're traditionally used, right? Uh, for example, moxibustion, you know, in, in acupuncture is the application of heat to specific, you know, areas of the body, either through the needle or through directly on the skin. Um, there's also been a longstanding interest, for example, in, in, in Europe, right? Uh, people in, naturopath, in, in natural medicine of going and taking, you know, baths of different, you know, temperatures. And, and, it, and there's, a, there's a, the, the idea that this could strengthen physiology in general, or perhaps even the immune system. Uh, we think that this is, this is an area that uh, could very well benefit for, from uh, research uh, and such as what you're doing. So, uh, we, you know, we, this is definitely an area that uh, understanding, you know, we know that uh, regulation of, you know, body therapy, temperature, whole body therapy involves, you know, the hypothalamus, the autonomic nervous system, many other uh, factors that we we need to know better uh and and how does that interface with the other body systems right uh and so uh no so congratulations to you uh for uh just a very uh you know creative and and cutting edge research that you're doing next Thank time you. You, next time you visit elen we actually have some uh saunas set up on the third floor for our oh. work <laughs> seriously and Yes. And this is, I guess this is just my plug for a boy. It would be really cool if there was a, a special call or something for, for uh, applications in heat and cold therapies, because I think there's a lot of junior mm -hmm. investigators who are yeah. trying to get into this space. And um, I think it's just really exciting. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm writing this down. I mean, you can't, I mean, we, we cannot do a special RFAs for, you know, everything. But you know, this is definitely an area that 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 is that is of interest. So great. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, a couple of questions now from uh, comments here to uh, from the chat to balance it. Uh, I like the um, little preamble here. I'm going to read it directly. Um, forgive this frank question, but how can NCCIH and integrative medicine generally counter the immense power of pharmaceutical industries that influence, if not dictate, health policy? Uh, their framework is biochemical by by definition and profit driven. There's an easy question for you. Well, you know, it, it's not my my role to comment on healthcare policy, you know, but what NCIH can do is to uh, fund and encourage uh, research that can provide the data, right? I mean, this is this is really our main approach it, that that. that Insurance companies need data in order to make their decisions. Uh, and also government agencies like Center for Medicare Services. How I can say one thing though, is that we are making some inroads in that area. So uh, we have recently uh, funded a study in collaboration with Center for CMS, Center for Medicare Services, to look at acupuncture for low back pain in older adults. And CMS, even though CMS looked at the literature and they said, well, there's a lot of evidence for acupuncture um, for back pain, yes, but very little in older adults. And they had a fair point. Most of the studies, they would not recruit people in their 70s and 80s. Uh, is it safe? Um, you know, is it useful? So we they decided they wanted to, to have uh, a, a study to look at that. And we said, okay, fine, we'll do it. And so we fund a study and then they, they decided that their coverage determination ended up happening anyway. They, fig they figured that there wasn't enough evidence. However, the study will be used to look at different dosages of how many, mm -hmm. and that's important because are they going to reimburse, you know, five sessions, 10 sessions, I don't know. You know, so, so this is, this is the, the partnership is an example 
of how we can partner with, um, with uh, for example, CMS to, to start moving some. And once Medicare covers something, then a lot of times insurance companies follow suit. So what we can do is to do research. And that's, that's, what, that's all we can do at NIH. But we can, we can be smart in how uh, we do this research to provide the kind of data that insurance companies uh, need. Thank you. Um, uh, Asunda Schwag, I don't know if you have a question or if you're on video. OK. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, really wonderful talk. Really appreciate your work, um, both of you guys, Dr. Adler and Dr. Langevin. Um, briefly, Dr. Langevin, actually, when I was in medical school, I found your work. And um, during an opportunity during a UCSF radiology rotation, I did a project um, talking about your work with oral formation and the different types of needles and the connective tissue response. So really amazing, amazing, incredible work that you've been doing for so many years. Um, thank you. But fast forward. Um, I'm, I'm now a um, functional medicine doctor in, in the Bay Area and um, founder of the California Center for Functional Medicine. We also started a nonprofit, the Functional Medicine Research and Technology Center. And one area that we're very, very interested in researching, um, we've done some wellness, health and wellness programs with first responders, firefighters and police. Um, and in particular, as you may know, you know, the top two ways that firefighters die are cancer and suicide. And so, I mean, so incredibly preventable, you know, the, the whole health model that you presented with the analysis versus the synthesis, we're trying to figure that piece out. So the question is, um, you know, do you guys have your eyes on this problem and integrations between so many different federal departments, even military veterans, et cetera, but first responders in particular um, with these issues and, and particular funding opportunities that we might um, participate in? This is, I didn't know the statistics about the first responders. Uh, you're talking about civilian uh, first responders. Firefighters, police, EMTs, yeah. frontline, I mean, yeah, the list goes on. Veterans, military, um, you know, suicide is common. Oh, I knew about the, the military, but but so your this statistic. Yeah, yeah, so firefighters, the number one and two ways that they die are cancer and suicide. And then on duty is sudden cardiac death and heart attack, but globally it's cancer and suicide. And cancer is—is is it related to yeah. toxicity of? It's related to everything. It's related to sleep. It's related to diet. It's related to circadian rhythm disruption. To stress. To little t trauma, big t trauma. I mean, the toxins. The list goes on. Yeah. Mm. All the all the factors that come play, right? Well, we do a lot of work in the with the military uh, population. Uh, a lot of work, especially with. Uh, uh, pain and we're, we're we think that this is actually some a model that could be expanded Agreed. to look at a lot of co-occurring conditions so but the first responders also of this this the civilian first responders um you know this is another um as you're pointing out very very vulnerable uh population that um is uh, under tremendous amounts of stress right yeah. Uh, and the connection between stress and the development of of multiple you know types of health problems is 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 well documented. What, what we're particularly interested in, obviously, is and this could apply to other jobs at high stress. Is how do you help mitigate this? You know, yeah. what are the tools that we can have at our disposal to help people to manage their stress? Uh, if it's if the stress is an inevitable part of their job, they can't change that. Is, yeah. So we recently have started a new uh, kind of well, not really campaign, but we, we really put a uh, emphasis on something called press reset on stress. It's just something that we we have on our website. It's to encourage and 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 help people to understand that there are simple tools that people can use that are that that they can be applied very you know easily like breathing techniques for example relaxation techniques that don't necessarily mean you have to go to a yoga class and you know a special instruction so people i think there's a bit of a misconception that these techniques are difficult and and that you need to you know uh you know belong to a certain you know group of you know religion or something like that to do meditation you know it's 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 to really make this more accessible to people. So we think this is an area that is quite important. 
uh, in this is more in our sort of dissemination and education uh, mission to so that people understand better uh, the importance of this. But thank you for um, for this comment about the the first responders. This is this yeah. Is thank you. I'll look up that program. I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Um, we're going to try to squeeze one last question in because it's from Dr. Rick Hecht. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, uh, yeah, Rick, if you will distill your question and then we'll hope for a, a little bit of a briefer answer so we can uh, end on time. But I do think it's an interesting question. Go ahead, Rick, please. Thanks, Alan. That was a great talk and uh, I think really exciting directions that NCCIH is going in. Um, my question is, I did find myself scratching my head a little bit at one point, which was the AI, when you talked about AI, uh, as a, an approach to understanding what we need to do to improve health and diabetes. We know all kinds of lifestyle things that need to be implemented, for example, already in type 2 diabetes. To me, the challenge are things like how you actually get that behavior change. How, how do you see AI as being the thing that we need to invest in to figure out what to do to improve health and things like diabetes? Can, ah. can, you, can you make concrete? <laughs> what, how is it going to really help? Where I think artificial intelligence can be helpful is to help uh, to help us understand the 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 multi system problems. So diabetes is one. I mean, we know that diabetes, right, is is goes across many many different systems. I mean, a lot of people will with type two diabetes also have different elements of the metabolic syndrome, right? They have cardiovascular problems. Um, they have problems with their lipids. Uh, but they also have other problems as well. You know, they have a lot of times people also get uh, weight gain and they will ha also have problems with their um, um, their joints, pain, uh, musculoskeletal pain, degenerative joint disease, because not just because of the being overweight, but also about uh, inflammation that can have uh, in, um, from fatty infiltration of tissues in, in around the joints and muscles. Their muscles don't function as well because they have lipo, uh, you know, lipid infiltration and myosteatosis that can affect the liver. You know, there's interactions between all of these different sim systems, and you know, we I think that our understanding the of the metabolic syndrome is uh, already quite extensive, but I could I think by incorporating various different aspects, sleep is another piece of this. Um, do we are did we really understand right the impact that. Uh, not getting not enough sleep has on all of these different types of metabolisms. I think that's the piece where a really whole person approach using a deep phenotyping, for example, and uh, and artificial intelligence can help us identify the, the 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 connections between these two systems that are important where you could act upon. So, having said that, we already know. The, 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 the therapies that, that can and should be, uh, you know, emphasized for patients are, we already know what they are, you know, good diet, you know, weight loss, et cetera. But there are maybe other things such as managing stress that understanding better the impact that it has on these other systems uh, may help us, you know. So, um, you know, I hope this gets at your question, uh, but um, I think this is still a work in progress. Thank you so much. Thank you, both of you, um, for um, addressing a, a, a rather large topic in a very, very short number of uh, seconds. Um, uh, let us pause now to say uh, thank you so much, Ellen, for joining us. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, virtual applause from, from the community. Um, it, it's such a pleasure to have you uh, and to learn uh, more about exciting next steps for NCCIH and all of us. Well, thank um, you for having me. It's always nice to visit with the Osher Center. <laughs> really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.